Okay, so you remember from chapter five that Deet has come and gotten Heidi and taken her away. So here we are in chapter six, and the title is A New Chapter About New Things. In her home at Frankfurt, Clara, the little daughter of Air Seisman, was lying on the invalid couch on which she spent her whole day, being wheeled in, in it from room to room. Just now, she was in what was known as the study, where, to judge by the various things standing and lying about, which added to the cozy appearance of the room, the family was fond of sitting. A handsome bookcase with glass doors explained why it was called the study, and here, evidently, the little girl was accustomed to have her lessons. Clara's little face was thin and pale, and at this moment, her two soft blue eyes were fixed on the clock, which seemed to her to go very slowly this day, and with a slight accent of impatience, which was very rare with her, she asked, "'Isn't it time yet, Fräulein Rottenmeier?' This lady was sitting very upright at a small work table, busy with her embroidery. She had on a mysterious looking loose garment, a large collar or shoulder cape that gave a certain solemnity to her appearance, which was enhanced by a very lofty dome-shaped headdress. For many years past, since the mistress of the house had died, the housekeeping and the superintendence of the servants had been entrusted by Herr Seisman to Fräulein Rottenmeier. He himself was often away from home, and he left her in sole charge, with the condition only that his little daughter should have a voice in all matters, and that nothing should be done against her wish. As Clara was putting her impatient question for the second time, Deet and Heidi arrived at the front door, and the former inquired of the coachman, who had just got down from his box, if it was too late to see Fräulein, Fräulein Rottenmeier. That's not my business, grumbled the coachman. Ring the bell in the hall for Sebastian. Deet did so, and Sebastian came downstairs. He looked astonished when he saw her, opening his eyes till they were nearly as big as the large round buttons on his coat. Is it too late for me to see Fräulein Rottenmeier? Deet asked again. That's not my business, answered the man. Ring that other bell for the maid Tinette. And without troubling himself any farther, Sebastian disappeared. Deet rang again. This time, Tinette appeared with a spotless white cap perched on the top of her head and a mocking expression of face. What is it? She called from the top of the stairs. Deet repeated her question. Tinette disappeared, but soon came back and called down again to Deet. Come up, she's expecting you. Deet and Heidi went upstairs and into the study, Tinette following. Deet remained standing politely near the door, still holding Heidi tightly by the hand, for she did not know what the child might take it into her head to do amid these new surroundings. Fräulein Rottenmeier rose slowly and went up to the little new companion for the daughter of the house to see what she was like. She did not seem very pleased with her appearance. Heidi was dressed in her plain little woolen frock, and her hat was an old straw when bent out of shape. The child looked innocently out from beneath it, gazing with unconcealed astonishment at the lady's towering headdress. What is your name? asked Fräulein Rottenmeier, after scrutinizingly examining the child for some minutes, while Heidi, in return, kept her eyes steadily fixed upon the lady. Heidi, she answered in a clear, ringing voice. What? What? That's no Christian name for a child. You were not christened that. What name did they give you when you were baptized? Continued Fräulein Rottenmeier. I do not remember, replied Heidi. What a way to answer, said the lady shaking her head. Deet, is the child a simpleton or only saucy? If the lady will allow me, I will speak for the child, for she is very unaccustomed to strangers, said Deet, who had given Heidi a silent poke for making such an unsuitable answer. She is certainly not stupid, or nor yet saucy. She does not know what it means, even. She speaks exactly as she thinks. Today, she is for the first time in a gentleman's house, and she does not know good manners, but she is docile and very willing to learn, if the lady will kindly make excuses for her. She was christened, christened Adelaide after her mother, my sister, who is now dead. Well, that's a name that one can pronounce, 
remarked Fräulein Rottenmeier. But I must tell you, Diet, that I am astonished to see so young a child. I told you that I wanted a companion of the same age as the young lady of the house, one who could share her lessons and all her other occupations. Fräulein Clara is now over twelve. What age is this child? If the lady will allow me, began Diet again in her usual fluent manner, I myself had lost count of her exact age. She is certainly a little younger, but not much. I cannot say precisely, but I think she is ten or thereabouts. Grandfather told me I was eight, put in Heidi. Deet gave her another poke, but as the child had not the least idea why she did so, she was not at all confused. What? Only eight? cried Fräulein Rottenmeier angrily. Four years too young. Of what use is such a child? And what have you to, and what have you learnt? What books did you have to learn from? None, said Heidi. How? What? How then did you learn to read? continued the lady. I have never learned to read or Peter either, Heidi informed her. Mercy upon us! You do not know how to read? Is it really so? exclaimed Fräulein Rottenmeier, greatly horrified. Is it possible? Not able to read? What have you learnt then? Nothing, said Heidi, with unflinching truthfulness. Young woman, said the lady to Deet, after having paused for a minute or two to recover from her shock. This is not at all the sort of companion you led me to suppose. How could you think of bringing me a child like this? But Deet was not to be put down so easily and answered warmly. If the lady will allow me, the child is exactly what I thought she required. The lady described what she wished for, a child unlike all other children, and I could find no other to suit. For the greater number I know are not peculiar, but one very much the same as the other. And I thought this child seemed as if made for the place. But I must go now, for my mistress will be waiting for me. If the lady will permit, I will come again soon and see how she is getting on. And with a bow, Dee quickly left the room and ran downstairs. Fräulein Rottenmeier stood for a moment taken aback and then ran after Dee. If the child was to stop, she had many things yet to say and ask about her. And there the child was, and what was more, Dee, as she plainly saw, meant to leave her here. Heidi remained by the door where she had been standing since she first came in. Clara had looked on during the interview without speaking, and now she beckoned to Heidi and said, Come here. Heidi went up to her. Would you rather be called Heidi or Adelaide? asked Clara. I am never called anything but Heidi, was the child's prompt answer. Prompt answer. Then I shall always call you by that name, said Clara. It suits you. I have never heard it before, but neither have I ever seen a child like you before. Have you always had that short curly hair? Yes, I think so, said Heidi. Are you pleased to come to Frankfurt? went on Clara. No, but I shall go home tomorrow and take grandmother a white loaf, explained Heidi. Well, you are a funny child, exclaimed Clara. You were expressly sent for to come here and to remain with me and share my lessons. There will be some fun about them now that you cannot read. Something new to do, for often they are dreadfully dull, and I think the morning will never pass away. You know my tutor comes every morning about 10 o'clock, and then we go on with lessons till 2 and it does seem such a long time. Sometimes he takes up the book and holds it close up to his face as if he was very short-sighted, but I know it's only because he wants so gape, dreadfully to gape, and Fräulein Rottenmeier takes her large handkerchief out also now and then and covers her face with it as if she was moved by what we have been reading, but that is only because she is longing to gape too. And I myself often want to gape, but I am obliged to stop myself, for if Fräulein Rottenmeier sees me gaping, she runs off at once and fetches the cod liver oil and says I must have a dose, as I am getting weak again, and the cod liver oil is horrible, so I do my best not to gape. But now it will be much more amusing, for I shall be able to lie and listen while you learn to read. Heidi shook her head doubtfully when she heard of learning to read. 
Oh, nonsense, Heidi. Of course you must learn to read. Everybody must. My tutor, and my tutor is very kind and never cross, and he will explain everything to you. But mind, when he explains anything to you, you won't be able to understand, but don't ask any questions or else he will go on explaining and you will understand less than ever. Later, when you have learnt more and know about things yourself, then you will be able to understand what he meant. Fraulein Rottenmeier now came back into the room. She had not been able to overtake Diet and was evidently very much put out for she had wanted to go into more details concerning the child and to convince Diet how misleading she had been and how unfit Heidi was as a companion for Clara. She really did not know what to be about or how to undo the mischief, and it made her all the more angry that she herself was responsible for it, having consented to Heidi being fetched. She ran backwards and forwards in a state of agitation between the study and the dining room, and then began scolding Sebastian, who was standing looking at the table he had just finished laying to see, laying to see that nothing was missing. You can finish your thoughts tomorrow morning. Make haste, or we shall get no dinner today at all. Then, hurrying out, she called to Ned, but in such an ill-tempered voice that the maid came tripping forward with even more mincing steps than usual. But she looked so pert that even Fräulein Rottenmeier did not venture to scold her, which only made her suppressed anger the greater. See that the room is prepared for the little girl who has just arrived, said the lady with a violent effort at self-control. Everything is ready. It only wants dusting. It's worth my troubling about, said Tanette mockingly as she turned away. Meanwhile, Sebastian had flung open the folding doors leading into the dining room with rather more noise than he need, for he was feeling furious, although he did not dare answer back when Fräulein Rottenmeier spoke to him. He then went up to Clara's chair to wheel her into the next room. As he was arranging the handle at the back, at the back preparatory to, do, to, do, preparatory to doing so, Heidi went near and stood staring at him. Seeing her eyes fixed upon him, he suddenly growled out, well, what is there in me to stare at like that? Which he would certainly not have done if he had been aware that Fräulein Rottenmeier was just then entering the room. You look so like Peter, answered Heidi. The lady housekeeper clasped her hands in horror. Is it possible? She stammered half aloud. She is now addressing the servant as if he were her friend? I never could have imagined such a child. Sebastian wheeled the couch into the dining room and helped Clara onto her chair. Fräulein Rottenmeier took the seat beside her and made a sign to Heidi to take the one opposite. They were the only three at table, and as they sat far apart, there was plenty of room for Sebastian to hand his dishes. Beside Heidi's plate lay a nice white roll, and her eyes lighted up with pleasure as she saw it. The resemblance which Heidi had noticed had evidently awakened in her a feeling of confidence towards Sebastian, for she sat as still as a mouse and without moving until he came up to her side and handed her the dish of fish. Then she looked at the roll and asked, Can I have it? Sebastian nodded, throwing a side glance at Fräulein Rottenmeier to see what effect this request would have upon her. Heidi immediately seized the roll and put it in her pocket. Sebastian's face became convulsed. He was overcome with inward laughter, but knew his place too well to laugh out loud. Mute and motionless, he still remained standing beside Heidi. It was not his duty to speak, nor to move away until she had helped herself. Heidi looked wonderingly at him for a minute or two and then said, Am I to eat some of that too? Sebastian nodded again. Give me some then, she said, looking calmly at her plate. At this, Sebastian's command of his countenance became doubtful, and the dish began to tremble suspiciously in his hand. You can put the dish on the table and come back presently, said Fräulein Rottenmeier with a severe expression of face. Sebastian disappeared on the spot. As for you, Adelaide, I see I shall have to teach you the first rules of behavior, continued the lady housekeeper with a sigh. I will begin by explaining to you how you are to conduct yourself at table. 
and she went on to give Heidi minute instructions as to all she was to do. And now, she continued, I must make you particularly understand that you are not to speak to Sebastian at table or at any other time unless you have an order to give him or a necessary question to put to him. And then you are not to address him as if he was someone belonging to you. Never let me hear you speak to him in that way again. It is the same with Tanette. And for myself, you are to address me as you hear others doing. Clara must herself decide what you are to call her. Why, Clara, of course, put in the latter. Then followed a long list of rules as to general behavior, getting up and going to bed, going in and out of the room, shutting the doors, keeping everything tidy, during the course of which Heidi's eyes gradually closed, for she had been up before five o'clock that morning and had had a long journey. She leaned back in her chair and fell fast asleep. Fraulein Rottenmeier, having at last come to the end of her sermonizing, said, Now, remember what I have said, Adelaide. Have you understood it all? Heidi has been asleep for ever so long, said Clara, her face rippling all over with amusement, for she had not had such an entertaining dinner for a long time. It is really insupportable that one has to go through this with this child exclaimed Fraulein Rottenmeier in great indignation, and she rang the bell so violently that Tanette and Sebastian both came running in and nearly tumbling over one another. But no noise was sufficient to wake Heidi, and it was with difficulty they could rouse her sufficiently to get her along to her bedroom, to reach which she had to pass first through the study, then through Clara's bedroom, then through Fraulein Rottenmeier's sitting room, till she came to the corner room, that had been set apart for her. Wow. So this is a whole new life that Heidi's coming into. Tomorrow, we will read chapter seven. Fraulein Rottenmeier spends an uncomfortable day. We'll see about that tomorrow. See you then.